Welcome everyone. I'm joined today by Arag Danagulyan, an Associate Professor of Nuclear Science and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States. Uh, much of Danagulyan's research focuses on the field of nuclear security. In 2019, he received the prestigious Arms Control Person of the Year Award for his work developing an innovative nuclear disarmament verification process. Professor Danagulyan, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me here. Uh, so you've spoken with CivilNet in the past about the intersection between science, education, and defense. Uh, how do you see this developing in Armenia? And how, in your view, should Armenian scientists and educators work to improve the country's national security? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, um, there's a couple of aspects to this problem. One of them is the nature of, this, of the scientific research. Um, there is quite a bit of what is referred to as siloing in a research in that people work on a particular type of problem and they really don't look outside of the problem. Okay. And a lot of scientists historically were sort of, their culture was that of really only thinking about a particular area they're working on rather than seeing themselves as citizens, um, people who could use the, could bear their skills, uh, bring their skills to bear on societal problems, and defense being one of the perhaps most acute ones in, in, case, of, uh, in case of Armenia. Um, a lot of that it's in, it, in it itself comes from the way uh, scientists are raised at the level of university education, but also even how kind of at the school level, how children are often raised to really focus on one thing and not think about other things because it's none of your business, uh, which, is very, which is very sad. Um, uh, we talk a lot about multidisciplinary research, okay, everywhere, not just in Armenia, in the world. And the reason is because most of the most pressing problems and most interesting problems, I would say, are highly multidisciplinary. What does multidisciplinary mean? It means problems that have components that are physics, components that are mathematics, components that could be biology, chemistry, uh, policy, and then defense, right? And uh, in order for someone to really have a contribution in that, in that, on that problem, they need to be technically very capable, but they also need to have a general scientific and societal erudition. They need to be interested about other disciplines, okay? And they need to be interested as to what is, um, you know, what does society need? They need to see themselves as members of society. Um, there is a long story, which I don't want to spend the whole interview talking about this, but. Um, where in 1948, MIT decided to add the School of Humanities, okay, which it didn't have before, because it felt that the scientists were, after the invention of nuclear weapons, the scientific community in the United States found, decided, determined, decided or came to a conclusion that scientists are too detached from society. And they need to take classes in humanities, they need to take classes in history, they need to take courses in social sciences, in literature, in music, so that they are more erudited, broader thinkers, not just specialists, but thinkers, Okay, who can contribute positively to, to our society rather than create weapons without thinking about their impact on society. Um, if you look at the curriculum in the Armenian um, institutions of higher education, you'll notice that it's like, it's all, let's say in physics, I, I'm fair, fairly familiar with the physics curriculum, like it's all physics and mathematics. There is trivial amount of humanities and social sciences, and even other disciplines such as chemistry and biology are mostly missing. Okay? which is very unfortunate, it's extremely unfortunate, and many people I talk to, they don't even understand what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about the importance, something that is so obviously, seen as so obviously necessary in the West, in, in the United States specifically, here very often is seen as like, why would a physicist want to learn about biology? You know? like, yeah, because you know, most of the problems are at the intersection of physics, biology, chemistry, and all the things. Um, now, specifically about the defense, so defense is just one of the examples of multidisciplinary research, right? There's nothing really too, too, uh, too special about defense or defense industry or anything like that. The defense industry is mostly just a, you know, um, um, is a derivative of civilian industry, right? Uh, um, the problems over there are further bigger because if you want to have an effective contribution to defense and security, you need to work with the military establishment and the military establishment needs to work with the scientific technological engineering um, community. Okay, so how is it organized in the, in the West and specifically in the United States? I'm most familiar with the United States because I worked in, not exactly in field of defense, but I worked in field of cargo security, which is somewhat related to, to somewhat related to defense. And I've had many masters and PhD students who were army officers, as well as air force officers. Um, I, first of all, one thing that I see is that the military establishment is very technologically capable in the, on the individual level. 
many of my students, PhD students who come from West Point uh, Academy, who come from Air Force Academy, uh, I know many students from the um, U.S. Naval Academy. They are they their level of knowledge of mathematics, physics, engineering is very comparable to that to the civilian students. Okay, I mean U.S. Army officers, most of them have essentially they have some uh, bachelor's degree in something. Plus, on top of that, they are also military. Um, if you want to have a technological military, you need to have officer corps that is technologically very savvy and very capable. There's, you cannot expect a sci uh, officers who know nothing about science to control a complex system like a push button thingy. Okay, it doesn't work that way. They really don't understand how the system works for it, uh, for them to be effective at using it and uh, leveraging it towards you know their their uh, combat uh, kind of missions. Um, so one thing that is, so I already talked about the scientists, they need to be more open-minded about problems outside of their narrow disciplines. And I talked about the military needing to uh, be more technically savvy, but more importantly, the military establishment, meaning like Ministry of Defense, for example, and the army, they need to hire scientists, okay, in their, for example, in their contracting offices, in their decision-making kind of, you know, structures. They need to have their own R&D, um, uh, essentially, offices that fund R&D, work with the engineering community, and uh, can provide the expert knowledge in terms of deciding and kind of piloting technological development. Uh, I talk to people in the uh, defense industry in Armenia, and the most common complaint I hear is that they come tell us, oh, we want something, they give us very general kind of uh, specifications. We spend two years working on it, and they tell us, oh, no, this is not what we wanted. It's ridiculous. No business is ever going to survive in that environment. No one is going to work on defense, okay? It's not surprising that we're not having any progress in, in, that, in that regard. You need to have something more <coughs> like laddered kind of approach. In the United States, we have this technical level, uh, readiness level uh, ladder from one to ten where the particular funding agency works with the particular um, businesses or particular R&D um, groups and they, um, um, you know, they, they, they together they work and they, 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 they get guidance from the military, the, I don't know, the company gets guidance and they work their way all the way to TRL 10 where you have a final product. <coughs> That's how typically um, solutions are uh, created. And I'm extremely worried by the lack of reform in the military in these regards. Two years have passed since the war, Everyone has been talking about this. Not much seems to have happened. Uh, given your expertise in the field of nuclear physics, I would love to talk a bit about Metsamor, Armenia's nuclear power plant. Uh, in your opinion, what should Metsamor's future be and what can the government do in this regard? So Metsamor has been there since the late 70s and um, there's lots of misconceptions about the danger level of Metsamor, the safety level of Metsamor. People call it all kinds of things. There's warts flying and things like that. Um, uh, it's probably worth, first of all, telling people well, how dangerous is Metsamor. It would be false to say that Metsamor is as safe as Western-styled pressurized water reactors. It is a pressurized water reactor, but it would not prove that it's uh, as safe as Western pressurized water reactors because of one key reason. It does not have what is called containment building, that in case of an accident, what's called loss of coolant accident, at a meltdown, it would contain most of the um, <clears throat> radioactive um, Contamination. On the other hand, it's nowhere. It's it's also completely false to compare it to um, a graphite moderated reactors like the Chernobyl. Everyone likes to compare it to Chernobyl because both are Soviet reactors. No, it's are highly different reactors. Chernobyl was a fundamentally flawed design, deeply flawed design, uh, which uses graphite for moderation. Petsamor uses water for moderation, which makes it physic at the physics level much safer. So <clears throat> not as safe as a Western style, nowhere near as dangerous as, as Chernobyl. Um, it was relaunched in the 90s due to the pragmatic need, understanding that either we have um, not Western standard safety reactor or we lose our country. Right. Uh, sooner or later, Metzauer has going to be shut down because uh, the built up of fatigue in its um, pressure vessel. You can annul it that many times. Um, <clears throat> question is, what do we want in place of Metsamor? And that's a difficult question to answer um, for a variety of reasons. I am generally very supportive of nuclear power. However, one needs to be cognizant that nuclear power is quite expensive. Reactors are not cheap. 
finding a reactor of the appropriate size for Armenia is not trivial because nobody makes small reactors like Mezamura anymore. Most countries, most vendors uh, such as Rosatom, Areva, you know, um, uh, the American um, General Electric, they make massive reactors, gigawatt reactors, <clears throat> which Armenia probably doesn't need. Um, so I, I think uh, I think Armenia. What is necessary here is some kind of a study, which, for example, takes into account the fact that Armenia has a significant amount of renewables. Armenia has quite a bit of sun and wind. Sun and wind are also themselves limited because they are highly intermittent. You know, sun the clouds come in, no sun, uh, wind stops blowing. But more than that, most of our demand of electricity is exactly the times when sun is not shining, wind is not blowing. <laughs> so uh, storage becomes a problem. Uh, nevertheless, wind and solar can be a uh, valuable co component in your energy mix if you also uh, couple it with what's called dispatchable sources of energy, like gas. Okay, so if you have enough gas and wind and sun sort of stop, okay, then you can turn on gas and then when wind and wind kicks up and the sun starts shining, you tr tr throttle your gas fired plants, save on gas, which is expensive. And then now you have like you no know, renewable energy. So someone needs to sit down and look at this systemically. Okay. Um, and I don't have a short, I don't have a short uh, answer. As I, as I said, nuclear has quite a bit of advantages. It truly is clean. Okay. Um, its CO2 emissions are quite small. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of overall safety per unit of energy produced, it's significantly safer uh, than gas. Okay. It's much safer than coal. Okay, which is kind of there's we have this preposterous situation in, in, in Germany that's shutting down nuclear power plants and they're and they're increasing gas uh, they're burning gas which is killing people by every year about half a million people die from uh, coal ash from coal fired power plants. Okay, for for, for comparison, every year half a million. Uh, like for comparison, the number of people who died in Chernobyl was fifty thousand. So every year we have ten Chernobyls worth of people dying from coal and everyone is okay with that every year. Okay. Um, so, uh, to co come back to the question, I hope that there will be some, some systemic approach towards this problem and there will be some kind of a solution, you know, um, I, but, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very important uh, question because Armenia's energy needs are going to increase over time and then we're probably going to lose Mezamur at some point because it's getting older and older and we need a solution soon. If we have to replace Mezamur with another nuclear power plant, it takes at least five years to build one. And like we should be building one tomorrow if that's what we're going to do. Okay, and then we have to decide whether we're going to do it. So this is actually quite a bit of a critical uh, question. Uh, I'd also love to talk a bit about the launch of Armenia's first ever space satellite in May, which attracted quite a lot of attention, both here in Armenia and in the diaspora. Uh, the government has said that the satellite will have a wide variety of issues, including in defense. Uh, I'm wondering what are some real expectations we can have from this development. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not an aeroastro engineer by any means. I have some general, just through general erudition, my, my knowledge about uh, uh, you know space, uh, satellite technology as well as space imagery. So what I understand is a 16U satellite. It's about this big, 16 liters. Um, it's uh, part of these what are called uh, you know microsats, nanosats, which essentially what you do is that rather than launching one big satellite, you launch a bunch of satellites together. And there's multiple customers, everyone has their satellite, and uh, then the company that launches it also provides some of the you know, telemetry and some of the management of, the, uh, of, the, of this asset. Um, from what I understand from, this, from the satellites, it's about this big, it has a you know, diameter of about, if I'm not mistaken, 20 centimeters, the, you know, the aperture. From there you can calculate the diffraction limit, which translates to about one at a distance of 850 kilometers, which is the height. Um, it has a resolution of about 1.7, 1.8 meters. Whether that can be used in, in defense, maybe, maybe it can be used. Maybe you can differentiate, let's say, a tank from a truck, or you can at least find that there's some vehicles moving around. You probably cannot identify, well, you probably cannot see if there's like accumulation of like let's say, personnel or something like that. Most of the time for defense purposes, you need something like less than a meter resolution, significantly like, like kind of half a meter resolution, right? Uh, Google uh, Maps has like, Better, like better resolution than that, right? Um, uh, typically, this type of satellites, from what I understand, I may be wrong, but what I understand, they're mostly used for like agricultural purposes, for management of uh, you know environmental resources and things like that. 
Uh, and um, while there are satellites, there is satellite imagery already that you can buy, because there are services that will, that will sell it to you. The advantage of having your own satellite is that you can have, essentially, you control everything. Nobody can intercept it. Nobody can sort of, uh, in case of, I don't know, crisis, can come and sort of take away that uh, capability from you. So there is some, some advantage uh, in that. Um, given how much cheaper satellite imagery has gotten, I'm surprised that Armenia hasn't invested, hasn't done more. I think it could do more. It should probably acquire its own. Uh, I mean, the war in 2020 showed that we were extremely intelligence limited. Like we did not know what was happening on the other side of the front line, and that significantly reduced our ability to respond in time. So Armenia probably needs better, uh, so better high resolution solutions than this. Great. Well, Professor Danogulian, as always, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for joining us on CivilNet. My pleasure, as always.